of the parameters there. You know, change that initial starting shape. Um, let's go and have a go at that. Edit that. Let's just rub some of that out. Rub some of this out. This sort of tinkering attitude is one of the lovely things that Scratch encourages. I don't know, Michael, do you see problems with that sort of tinker around, tweak things, see what happens? I see this as you know, the way a lot of us learn this stuff, by just playing with the toys here. You know, what do you think? Okay, it's not quite Bridget Riley, is it? I think she'll be safe for a little while longer yet. Alan, you'll tell me to shut up when people get bored, won't you? All right, safe current practice. No, no, thank you. Right, if you go on to the internet thingy and say, you know, how can we use computers for maths education? You'll get page upon page upon page of websites which kind of say, I'm going to ask you a multiplication question. If you get the answer right, then I'm going to ask you another multiplication question. If you get the answer wrong, I'm going to ask you the same multiplication question. And it gets so boring, this sort of um, Skinner-esque, you know, biscuit type approach to maths education. You can do exactly the same sort of thing in Scratch if you would want to. Well, would you want to? Yes, because there's much more fun writing a program to teach somebody or to test somebody about arithmetic than there ever is in doing an arithmetic thing. Let's put it into display mode. Um, I'd like answers called out, please. Four fives. OK, it's a tough crowd tonight. Twelve. OK, two fives, ten, and so on. You get the idea. OK, nobody made any mistakes so far. Um, what would have happened if we didn't? And again, a really easy thing to code up. This is one of the introductory things which we do with our First year undergraduates doing this creative computing thing. The feedback when you get it wrong. Let's have another go at that, shall we? What is two times one? I'm not sure about this. This isn't going out on the live stream, is it? OK, so this one just says no in a very direct sort of way. There are arguments for doing much more interesting feedback. Here is a report written by Seymour Papert back in 1971, of all things. Somewhere in here he's talking about exactly the same sort of idea as I've just shown you. Oh, here it is. Incidentally, this is surely the proper use and concept of drill and practice. Writing such programs ideal project, the second term of an elementary school course. Said the best way to learn something to teach, better writing a teaching program is better still. Um, blah, 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 blah. Um, don't just tell him that it's the right answer if he's wrong. Give, give him some useful advice. I'm discussing what kind of advice is useful. He's deep into the understanding both the concept being taught and the process of teaching and learning. Um, what else have we got on there? I could sh let me show you the spelling one because this is quite cool. You won't be able to hear the speakers. We've got sound. One minute. Okay. So this works with lists. Here you go. Click on the green flag. Spell summer. Did you hear it? Spell yeah. summer. And I type in S U M E R. No. Okay. Spell autumn. And we have another go. And it takes that out of the list and keeps asking us the same thing. So what are the pedagogical assumptions underlying that? One minute, you say. One more thing to show you. Um, branching databases, animation. Let me show you some students' work. This is one of the outcomes from this creativity and computing course. Again, looking at how Scratch could be applied across the curriculum. So we take a work of children's literature and try and create games around that using the characters, using the situations from the book. So this isn't my work. This is two of my students. Paired programming project, lots of sort of agile development ideas coming in there. It takes a while to load. We're pushing the limits of what Scratch can do here. Here we go. Click on the green flag to start. We've got music, which I think they compose themselves. And we have a lovely little Hungry Caterpillar. Now, we're conscious that Eric Carl is litigious, but there is an exception in the Copyright Act for exam work. The Very Hungry Caterpillar. Isn't it gorgeous? A little egg lay on a leaf. Digital storytelling. Absolutely. <laughs> on Sunday morning, the warm sun came up. Come on. And then we have this idea of semiotic domain principles. We're not sure what this is, but it looks like something interesting to explore. Alan is going to throw a camel at me at this point. So I'm going to say thank you very much for your patience this evening. <laughs> yeah, well, I was, I was uh, minding my own business. I'm extremely uh, surprised to find myself standing here. But um, 
Do we, do we have any answers to the problem? What's the, let's, let's get that first. What's, what's the answer? You gamble. You gamble. This, this one is, uh, is I, I, have, I have a different math problem on each, uh, on each card, and that's probably um, uh, one of the hardest because, well, first of all, it contains this economics term, which is uh, uh, um, uh, risk neutral. But, but, um, but yeah, that says you, you assume the, uh, uh, that you'll go for the one with the greatest expectation <laughs> of gain and you, and you switch. Um, it actually, the reason I have that on there is because it leads to a hideous paradox. And maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go into that some other time. It's had seasoned mathematicians in a pickle for, uh, for days. <laughs> but um, um, but so, so I, I, yeah, I, ha I have strong views about, about teaching in maths. And I, uh, I was uh, talking to a friend recently who had been volunteering to go into schools and, uh, and, and teach maths. And I was completely, he was showing me some of the maths papers. I was completely horrified by them because... Uh, the, the questions on them, I thought, had absolutely nothing to do with maths. They contained a lot of questions in which you had to memorise the name of a shape with so many sides, or you had to memorise a particular technique for doing something, or, or something. None of them contained any, any of what I think is maths, which is, which is using creativity to solve problems. That's what maths is. And for that reason, maths has an awful lot in common with, with computing as well. I mean, pr um, most of what happens in both maths and computer science is, is some form of communication and some form of problem solving. And the best one is not the one you've been taught at school, but the best solution. There, there, there is a, a good way of doing it often. And, uh, and what, they, what they do in schools tends to be teaching a technique, whereas what I think they should be doing is, is teaching people to look for a creative way of solving a problem. So I have, um, I have different problems on, on the back of all my business cards, um, and all of those are problems which I think have a nice, simple, creative solution. Actually, the one that's been read out today is the exception. It's, uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't really, but um, I'll give you another one. It's, it's one that's it's quite a famous problem, so some of you might have heard it. It's been uh, used, it gets, quite often gets used in, um, in interviews, but the, the question is this. You have uh, 5,419 people taking part in an enormous tennis tournament. Um, so it's like Wimbledon, it's a knockout. Um, the question is, how many matches does it take to find a winner? Now, uh, uh, that's got a very simple solution. Most people, when they, uh, when they hear that problem, will, will start trying to, uh, trying to draw a little triangle and say, right, first round, this is how many, second round, this is how many. Um, I've seen one hand go up. Do you, do you know the answer? Is it 5,419? It is, it is. And do you know why? Well, exactly, yeah, that's exactly it. So it's such a simple solution. Um, anyone of any age in school could understand that. Each match eliminates exactly one person, and, and yet people with a lot more experience in maths will, will take a longer to solve that, and that's the kind of solution which I think they should be teaching people in schools to, uh, to find. So um, um, that's pretty much uh, uh, all I've got to say, I think, so I'll, uh, I'll pass on to the next person. Great, but, um, And they're going to talk to you about something you will have heard about already, which is Hull Club. Yay. Yay. Yeah. Uh, I, I do kind of wish you told me I was speaking, though, especially since it's being live streamed. <laughs> uh, I, I could have prepared something. Um, but yeah, I, I'm Linda. That's Claire over there. Um, we founded Code Club uh, just over two months ago. Um, yeah, and uh, we're trying to inspire kids to learn to code, basically. And we're doing this by creating a nationwide network of volunteer-led after-school coding clubs for children aged 9 to 11, uh, which is uh, year 5 and 6. Sorry, I have to move it up here because it's, right. it's uh, <laughs> rustling. And so we're teaching them Scratch, basically. Uh, we're creating an uh, army of highly skilled, enthusiastic volunteer programmers. Nice army, Claire. <laughs> um, uh, who go into the schools um, one hour uh, a week per code club. And uh, yeah, they're just um, uh, helping teach Scratch. So we created all these um, little projects. Uh, that are, most of them are games. Uh, and 
Uh, this one, uh, Fish Chumps, uh, we thought at, uh, or we were there at a code club today when they were um, uh, doing this one. Uh, Fish Chumps is the first level two game that we have. And the kids were just having so much fun uh, uh, customizing the game. And we had this awesome evil Elvis the Shark that you're going to have to blog about evil Elvis the Shark. It was fantastic. You should have seen it. But um, they basically uh, follow instructions on our, on our sheet about how to do a game. But then the, we also leave room for play so they can do their own customizations. And we also have like op sort of uh, follow-up questions that there won't be any instructions for. So they're going to have to try to discover things for themselves. Uh, which is really hard for some of the kids, but um, I think as we have more and more code clubs, they, they keep getting better and better. It's a bit weird. We'll, we'll say something like, why, why don't you do this? And they'll have basically no idea how to do it. And some of them don't know how to start, but a big, uh, a big thing of, of being able to program is someone will approach you with a problem that hasn't been done before, and you'll have no idea how to do it and you just have to get on with the problem solving. And those are uh, you know, really uh, great skills to have for anyone, even if they don't go on to do any sort of programming or do anything with computers even. That is, like, that is what we're trying to teach, basically. Uh, and yeah, yeah, we already heard about Scratch. I don't need to say anything more about it. Um. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um. We also want to do uh, hardware things. Uh, I have a Lego Mindstorm kit. Uh, they can be hacked to use Scratch to control them. I, I recommend doing this because we don't like proprietary languages. And um, our most popular uh, project so far, although we, I only tested three, uh, so it doesn't say that much, but it's a candy sorter. So it uses the awesome uh, light sensor to basically sort Smarties into different colors. And all the kids have like a favorite smarty or they are, uh, well at least they have a favorite color. And then some are like really convinced that the blue one tastes a lot better than the other ones. And now they can actually build a robot that will sort all the blue ones from the other ones. So they, they like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, we are uh, over, it, but okay, we started 16th of, of April and, and not that long ago, uh, and we already have um, quite a lot of schools signed up wanting to do this. 1,766 volunteers <laughs> who are all sending us emails and asking questions. Um, but <laughs> it's amazing. Um, uh, it's amazing that so many people are willing to take one hour a week to go into their local school and, and teach this uh, for 12 weeks at a time. That is quite a commitment, but there are so many people willing to do it. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, yeah, um, I think one of the reasons we had so many people interested is because we, we had some good uh, publicity, um, BBC Wired, and uh, also we made um, a lot of friends uh, this is Team Code Club uh, hair <laughs> in a meeting room just there. Yeah. Uh, I think we are playing with some Arginas and there's a Raspberry Pi and some other things. Just it's it's nice when you when you get to just play with things for work. I like that a lot. Everyone should do this. Just. Um, have fun, uh, try to come up with some fun projects like we do, and then we test the projects on kids and we measure how fun they are in the amounts of like laughter and high fives and fist bumps that we get. And that's how we can yeah, see if they're any good, basically. Um, so yeah, uh, we get, <laughs> um, yeah, Nesta is uh, helping us uh, sort of mentoring us, they send us emails every now and again at least. Um, coding for kids, uh, we've been working from over there. Um, 
and uh, also Sidekick Studios, and then, of course, computing at school uh, have been very encouraging. Um, yeah, so, um, well, we actually have 22 pilot schools. We were going for 20, but uh, we couldn't say no <laughs> to some very enthusiastic ones, um, basically. Um, so we're testing our first scratch curriculum in these uh, 22 schools at the moment and getting loads of feedback, trying to improve on the projects that they've already done. Uh, it's basically a major user experience exercise for how to teach, or yeah, scratch. Um, so yeah, we're doing that, we're improving the projects. Um, in September, we're gonna have a lot more schools, which is exciting. We're doing the full 12 week um, uh, program of Scratch, also uh, then uh, following on from that, uh, Scratch for hardware, which is I think a bit more fun, but then you need money to buy the hardware, so um, that's, you know, it's a problem for some of the schools. Um, to buy things like Lego Monster. And so it was important to, for us to have the free stuff available first, and then the people who, who are more interested could do, I mean, after they've done maybe the initial one, they could have a fundraiser and try to get some hardware and do some more stuff. Um, unless we get a lot of funding. So in the not too distant future, uh, we want to do more, more <laughs> programming stuff. Uh, we're thinking of doing JavaScript um, next. After Scratch, it'll be like a nice sort of easy, easier <laughs> maybe uh, than like uh, hardcore like scripting. Mm, it's nice, yeah. But, and, and everything is done in JavaScript now anyway, so it's fine. Um, yeah, we want to. Okay, we want to run hack days to create new projects. Um, gonna have 500 code clubs. Yes, we can do it. <laughs> um, so uh, basically, come to our hack days. Um, and um, yeah, if you invent some fun projects, we'd like to, to know about it. But do come to our hack days and um, create projects that kids can do. Uh, buy our t-shirts. They are awesome. They will make you look, um, what is it, like 100% smarter and prettier? Something like that, yeah. Um, and then, uh, if you know someone rich, that would be good. And just, you know, um, take take our uh, projects and take them into schools and, and start teaching children to do things. So. Yes, thank you, Ellen. Thanks for the introduction. Um, now that you have learned to pronounce my name, next time comes the spelling test. Um, <laughs> That's actually a an, an very nice sort of this conversation that you just we're just having a nice introduction because I want to talk about self-directed learning because Ellen has set us the topic for the evening and that was, you know, what do I do next, miss? So I thought I'll talk about self-directed learning a bit. My name is Michael Kölling. I'm from the University of Kent and I work in the Computing Education Research Group there. And I'm talking quickly because I really do only one talk and I usually do it in either 90 minutes or 60 minutes. And now today I do it in 10 minutes and I still do the same thing. I just talk quickly. Um, so... I'm going to get started. Yeah, you're laughing now, but I'm not joking. <laughs> um, so, and actually, I also wanted to say it, it's great to hear Miles and Linda talk about Scratch because that's a really nice stepping stone. I get back to that Scratch and Greenfoot, what I'm going to show you about. It's, it's a nice sort of complementary you know, pair of bits of software. Um, Greenfoot is a programming environment for teaching and learning programming at high school level from about 14 years upwards. Um, and it can go all the way to sixth form and, in fact, into university. And I don't tell you a lot of background today. I'll just do a demo. Um, so the, on the plus side, I talk quickly, but I have no slides. I do only a demo. So I'll just show you what it is. Um, here's Greenfoot on the screen. Um, this is a Greenfoot window with a project already open. Um, I have a few classes here. It's an object on the system. It is based on Java. Um, so the classes here, I'm not teaching you Java tonight, just so if you don't know what the terminology means don't worry about it. Um, if I have a class, I can create an object. Actually, I'm not going to do that. I, I'm going to do this with this project first. So here, I've got a number of classes. I can create an object. This class is called Wombat. So I'm creating a Wombat object. And I have that in my 
world. And when I have an object in the world, I can click on it and I can see all the public methods of this. That is, all the actions that it can do. And I can interactively invoke them. So I can say to this Wombat, move, and it will move forward. And if I have a Wombat class, I can, of course, create many Wombats. So I can interactively play with my object-oriented programming system. Um, I can tell this Wombat to turn left, for example. I can tell it um, to move forward, and I can interact with these things. Um, I can put a number of leaves into the world which is another class that I have, so I can populate my world. Um, and then I have a run button here, and if I click run, all the Wombats run around and do something. Um, this is essentially what Greenfoot does for you, and what I'm going to show you next now is how to actually program this. The um, nice thing, even though Java is a professional you know, industri industry strength language, Greenfoot makes it rather easy. So if I put my crab in here, this is a different project, uh, this time we are still within animals, but this time we have a crab instead of wombats. If I click run here, nothing happens. And if we open the editor, we see it's a text-based language. It is actually standard Java. So I've got um, my code in the form of text, not blocks as in Scratch. Um, and we see there's essentially no code here. That's why this crab doesn't do anything. And I just write things such as move in here. So I tell this crab, every time the crab acts, it will move. Uh, it will move a bit forward, in fact. So if I compile this now, put the crab back in again, here I can click the Act button, which invokes the Act method that I have just written. And you see, every time I click this, the crab moves a little bit forward. And Run is just a loop around Act. So if I click Run, my crab moves across the screen. And when, if I have, I can drop more crabs into my program, and they all move across the screen. So I can now, this is the first program I've written. That was just writing my first program. I can now go and experiment with this. I can, for example, tell it to turn five degrees after every move. Um, so what will happen if I put the crab in and I let it run now? What will it do? <laughs> yeah, uh, some people are answering in gestures. And that's right, it will run in a circle. And of course, what students always do is then they fill the whole screen with crabs because they, and they, they just click and they have all the crabs running around in circles. Um, and then we go on from there. I won't show you a lot of detail. I'll just show you one more bit. If you, I'll show something like if greenfoot dot is key down. Um, and is key down is a method that, oops, I have mistyped that, is a method that tests whether the key on my keyboard is being pressed down and all the keys have names. Left is the name of my left arrow key. So of my cursor keys. So th now I'm turning only if my left cursor key is being pressed. And I'm turning minus 5 degrees. And I duplicate this here. And I say, OK, if my right cursor key is pressed, then I turn 5 degrees. So I put my crab in again. And now I run. And if I press my keys, well, I should make it run a little bit faster here. If I press now my keys on my keyboard, I can have already a keyboard-controlled gra graphical moving character on screen. Um, where this is going is something like this. I have then, um, this time here, I've got a turtle instead of a crab, but that's just a different image. Um, this is a game where my turtle is running around. I'm controlling the turtle with my keyboard, um, and I can, can run around, and I'm here trying to eat all the lettuces while trying to avoid being eaten by the, by the snake. Um, and that's what. So this is a kind of computer game that they, can, uh, that they can develop within a few hours. I do one-day workshops with school kids, sort of age 14 or so. They, and within three hours of contact, we write this game. Well, actually, without the score counter, just slightly simpler than this. It's just the, the scoring of the counter we don't usually do, but very close to this. And then, uh, or in, in a school situation, if you have them for an hour or two a week, Within two or three weeks, you can get them to do something like this. And where that is going, of course, is other games such as this. So this is a typical game that you can write in Greenfoot. So this is so typical arcade-style games is a thing that you can quite easily do. Um, um, yes, give me two minutes. Um, they don't have to be games. Um, anything that is graphical and inter interactive you can do. So here, that is another example which you can really quite easily do. Of course, it's an object-oriented system, so every key here is just an object. And the implementation of every key, the amount of code, 
is just this. This is, even in my largest font, just about a bit more than a page of code. So within just a few weeks, they can learn to write something like this. Um, this is a system that is based on pretty much the same philosophies as Scratch is. It's, it's based on f constructivist philosophies. Um, uh, Peppert is very influential there. And in fact, we are in, in regular contact with the MIT group who's developing Scratch. And there's a lot of overlap in philosophy. And so at the point where they hit the border, you know, the, the ceiling with Scratch, where their ambition outgrows what the system can do, is a good point to switch over into something like Greenfoot, because the concepts transfer really easily. Um, in Scratch, um, you get a much easier start. In Greenfoot, you have a little bit more um, overhead, but you also get more power. If you want something like uh, a few hundred objects uh, in Scratch, that is very, very hard in Scratch. And here, because Scratch is object-based, Greenfoot is class-based, creating multiple objects is really easy. So here I've got a few hundred ants running around, which in Greenfoot is really easy to do. In Scratch it would be very hard because you don't want 500 um, sprites there. And so once you hit that point, that's a very nice point to, to motivate the switch over. And a lot of people have worked on developing material for that switch over. Um, so I won't show you anything more today. The last thing I show you in my last 30 seconds is um, where you can find out more. Um, there is three websites. One, there is a blog um, called The Joy of Code. If you Google Joy of Code, you find that this is, these are video tutorials. Um, that um, are an introduction into programming with Greenfoot. And then there is a thing, well, there's a Greenfoot website where you can actually publish, like on the Scratch website, you can publish the programs and there's a discussion area and kids can get advice. And then there's a website called The Green Room, which is a site for teachers with teaching resources. So this is not for the kids, this is for the teachers with resources. And there are um, about 2,000 teachers on there and a lot of resources and you can find teaching material. For the self-directed learning, the video tutorials and the discussion side are the most important thing because that means that you know, if you have kids in your class that are much quicker than the others, you can point them to material. We have put a lot of effort in um, creating material that supports self-directed learning and enable them to find out things themselves. So if you have quick ones in your class, you can point them to that material and they can find out things themselves and progress faster than the others while you help the slower ones. Okay. Oh, and, and then I'll. present them to the class. Yes. Yeah. And then do all, you know, your teachers much more than I am, so you know what to do then. But the material is there for you to find and point them to. Okay. Um, so I hope you don't mind. Alan's just asked me to talk very quickly about um, basically what the hubs are and how, how they work. Um, and I think basically what we're here for today is um, what do I do next, Miss? And I think lots of people are coming to hubs uh, for that main reason. They want an answer to that question. What can we do next? Which is really exciting. Um, in Hertfordshire, um, Hertfordshire is 334 square miles. Uh, we've got 523 schools, 88 secondary schools. And I promise you, every single one of them knows about CAS. Okay? Um, so CAS can potentially be very, very powerful um, as a hub in, in Hertfordshire. Um, we have hub meetings every half term. And we have them in various locations across the county um, at the moment. I've just lost my notes. Um, ICT and computing teachers absolutely love it. Um, it's a great opportunity to get together. It's not an opportunity that we get every single day. We've got Germany. We've got Sophie here from, from the, the hub um, at the moment. And it's really, really uh, getting lots and lots of momentum. And there's lots more primaries um, getting involved, which is great as well. And it's really good because there's lots of links sort of emerging between the schools because of the hub. Uh, we have Hub Days, uh, we had a high ICT festival uh, where we had 56 secondary schools come along and we talked about the BBC Micro, uh, past and present. Uh, we, talked, we had a mass Codu session, um, we had the exam boards come to talk to us about the future quali of qualifications. And it's really good because it's lots of like-minded um, people that come together um, and share their ideas um, and share their knowledge, which is really nice, a really nice way of doing it. And then these half termly hubs. Uh, the latest one we had, we all talked about our Raspberry Pi experiences and things that have gone well, things that have not gone so well. Uh, and we had somebody that even showed us how to program the jumper pins on the Raspberry Pi, which was absolutely great. Um, but it's really good. We've got lots of people supporting us in the hub as well. Uh, the University of Hertfordshire has been there and has you know, provided us with a venue when we've needed it and with the technical knowledge as well. Um, and it's really good as well. There's lots of people from industry, you know, pe people in this room today that are offering their support to the hubs, which is absolutely great. Because people like me, I can't do it all on my own. So but as you, if you give me a bit of support, it's absolutely fantastic. 
Um, it's also really good because if, if you know, schools have got, need something, and we've got a bit of momentum um, to set some things up. So you know, we just set up the Computer Science 101 uh, A course in the hub, by the, by the hub, and it's got, gone really well. So yeah, if you've got any questions about the hub, speak to me. Thank you. To speak about GitHub, I've never met Mark before. But Mark said he, he, he has a few ideas he wants to share with us. I, I, I go again. to these dojos and I hear people talk about GitHub a lot, but I've never actually started using it. So I hope you're going to convert right. people who are not using okay, it. Well, and the reason that uh, I'm going to mention GitHub is because I've been teaching web development uh, years five and six um, in uh, my local school. So the background is that I had to relearn a load of stuff after not doing anything for a very long time. And one of my daughters, who was, we went away for a year and she was trying to learn French. And she said, no, Danny, I want to learn what you're learning because it's much easier than French. Try and teach me, try and teach me some of that. So uh, I tried to, uh, to teach her and then I got the idea of doing a, an after school club. Um, why do I think that web development languages are the, the, right, um, the right thing to be teaching to years five and six? Because they're real languages, which I think you can now say will still be in use in 15 years' time. And I don't think you were able to say that until a year or two ago, and now you are. Um, it, there's a lot of familiar tools that they'll be using. You know, they know what a browser is. They know what a text editor is. No software installation required. Um, I don't know how many months it would take me to put Scratch on all the machines in the IT suite in my school, kids' primary school. But <laughs> Pardon? Oh, right, okay. I didn't, whoops, sorry. Um, uh, everyone gets something, so every, everybody finds their level. You know, the, the people who struggle most will be able to do a bit of markup. S the people who, who are, you know, a bit more at ease will be doing styling, and then some people will fly with um, programming. Um, that's probably everything for there. Uh, why shouldn't you do it? Because JavaScript is not really a great first language, although people are doing some, uh, some things to make that a bit more palatable. So I wrote... Uh, a load, of, um, a load of lessons, and I put them on this thing called GitHub. So Git is a source control system which was written by Linus Torvalds, who wrote, um, wrote Linux. And GitHub is a kind of a social coding space where people who are into open source can put their code, and other people can look at it and improve on it and, and fork it and make it better and submit it back to them and say, hey, this is better, what do you think, and chat about it. And um, I think it's, it shouldn't be just for code, although it, it primarily is like 99.9% .9 for code at the moment. But there are people writing books on it. I think it would be brilliant for quality processes and also for syllabuses. So I've put my syllabus on there. So I will attempt to demonstrate to you, using a keyboard that is totally unfamiliar to me, how to, um, how to make a change to my syllabus. So here we have a uh, Web Dev Key Stage 2, if you search for that in GitHub, you will find, you'll find my thing. And in there we've got lessons. And it's not going to be too hard for me to find some rubbish that needs correcting, because when I was starting out, I just was rubbish at textile. So down here, I've got something that is horrid, this bit, this bit here. And that was looking at it through my account. Now I'm going to be a stranger who just stumbles across this and decides to fix it. So web dev key stage two. Quickly, quickly. Come on, GitHub. There's only one. It's not that hard. Oh. Well, there we are. I'll just click on that because I was playing with it earlier. Oh, there we are. I finally finished the search. So I'll, I'll go into here, and I'll say, oh, I want to edit this file. And it says here in print that you probably can't see, clicking this button will automatically fork this project so that you can edit the file. So I'm going to go down here and make my change. And hopefully, people would make more substantive changes than what I'm going to attempt to do. And I'm just too klutzy with an unfamiliar mouse. But anyway, I could make a change here. I will make some sort of really rubbish change. I will put a load of stuff in there. And I will propose the file change. And when I go back to where I was in Firefox, oh, which was where I was. At some point when the GitHub worker processes get round to it, I'll be told that 
another person has said, oh, I've made an improvement to your... Oh, actually, I was meant to fill in a field there. But anyway, you get the, you get the idea. So you can improve my stuff, which is not going to be hard for you because you're teachers and I'm an ex-developer. So the, the format of the lessons, which you would see if you went there, is I did an intro lesson, then I did several sets of HTML one week, CSS the next week, JavaScript the next week, and then a revision block, and then I did that, I think, three times. Uh, and then we started a project. The project was a wish list um, project. Um, but in the middle of that, we had a, uh, a brilliant lesson. The best lesson was a visiting professor who's a 16-year-old uh, young rewired state um, alumnus from the local secondary school who was uh, a brilliant coder, far better than I was at that age, or since, in fact. And uh, he inspired the kids. Um, He's in San Francisco now. <laughs> no, no, it's not. No, Harry's not in. Yeah. Harry's in San Francisco? Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> well, I told you he was quite good. <laughs> <laughs> um, for, for the... Um, for the wish list, I, I wrote a little server-side in Node and Mongo. You can st that's all on the, um, the repository as well. All you can use the one that, um, one that I've prepared. And I'll show you some of the things that the uh, kids have come up with for their project. This first one, this is one, one of the sort of most motivated kids. And he, uh, he went home and he played around and got... Oh, that's quite slow. No. He, uh, he found out about drop shadows in CSS3, which I did not tell him was a good idea, but he, he got his mum to buy him a book, and, he, that, and he's got absolutely no sense of colour. But, you know, you, you say, go and investigate something, and he will. And uh, that was... Sorry? Yeah, actually, this isn't, this isn't right. This is meant to be a different... I don't, I don't know what's wrong there. It's, it's worse looking than that, I tell you. Um, and there was another one, but, hey... That's, uh, that's not necessary. I will just uh, show you the okay. details of where it is. Uh, less, than, less than that. So um, it was a very small school. There were 90 people. Got <laughs> 10 to start with. I know, it's a very, very small school. A few, a few dropped out. Um, what went well? It went well-ish. You know, it's my first time teaching. They can all do a bit, but nobody... I don't think... It, well, maybe Andrew is going to be a star developer. Um, and that was the bit I wanted to show. So if you wanted to, uh, to use that as the basis for something that you were doing and uh, ideally contribute and make it better. Could you leave that on for a moment? I can. Hopefully some of your tweeting can tweet that. Because we've had a request for you to share. Somebody just tweeted me, can you share the, uh, the link? Yeah. Just to say the sound is fine. <laughs> Sorry, Web the sound is fine. Web dev key stage well. two. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, right, yeah, well, we're rapidly running out of time, so I'd like you to at least have a little bit of time to talk to each other and have a chat afterwards. But I will just very quickly show you a new tool that we launched about a week and a bit ago called Thimble. So Thimble is designed to give people their first few steps um, with the building blocks of the web. So. I'll do you a quick demo to show you just how easy this sort of stuff can be. This all lives at webmaker.org um, and you can find everything you need to there. They're all laid out in this same format which is HTML and CSS on the left hand pane and then it's rendered live on the right. So you have commented code um, that more experienced or older learners can read through to guide them through a project or if you have someone around to give them a few pointers we can do things like this first um, the image there we'll run off to the internet somewhere grab copy image location back into thimble and drop that straight in here and then you can see instantly it renders on the right hand side uh, we just, where it says top caption for that header one, we'll get rid of that because it's over the top. Uh, bottom caption, let's change that to something like welcome to Moz London. 
Uh, other bits and pieces you can play with, we could change the background color to anything you want. You can, let's move that down so we can read what's at the bottom. So down here as well, if you click on the right hand side, it jumps you straight to which element that you're playing with. So right, we've identified that's header two. So let's go down to the bottom. And if that's 220 pixels at the moment, let's see what it looks like with 320, not quite enough, 420. Now it's dropped off the bottom. Uh, and that's done. You click publish. Are you sure you want to publish because everyone can see it? Yeah. And then there's our, there's our code. If we grab this, drop it into a new window. That's now published on the web. You've taken someone from being a consumer through to creating something in a few minutes. Um, and that's what I'd like. If you've got a machine with you, um, go to webmaker.org. I'd love you to have a play with it tonight and get your feedback because it's fresh out of the tin. So we want, we want to get teachers using this stuff in classrooms and Code Club using it and Coder Dojo using it and everyone using it. So just to make things now, easy. When the, the Mozilla hit on a, this concept, isn't it really nice, this summer of code Summer code party. Summer code party, sorry. Su summer of code's a Google thing. <laughs> oh, right. Um, OK. Yeah. Summer code party. <coughs> and there's some stickers that you can collect from the desk on your way out. Yeah, to grab some. If you want stickers for your class or stickers you're doing like bits and pieces. Uh, if, you, if you do use Thimble or any of the tools, or even if you don't, even if you use some of Mark's resources or, or Code Club resources or whatever, um, over the next three months, we're collecting on a hashtag um, Moz Party things to to share, put on our Tumblr, um, share work that people take in their first steps. If you're learning anything about the web, anything about coding, um, it, it falls under the very broad church of the Summer Code Park.